Welcome to the podcast, Jill. Hi. Great to see you. Okay. So, um, yeah, I like to get these things started by, by giving the listeners a little bit of background. You, you have a pretty high profile uh, in, the, in the fintech space or in the banking space, but why don't you tell the listeners um, what you've done in your career, particularly before you got to Citizens Bank? Oh, well, I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, I enlisted in the Army after my sophomore year in college. Um, I didn't have a way to pay for school, and um, my family wasn't really um, supportive going to college, so um, the Army was my gateway to being able to fulfill that dream. So I enlisted um, and served as an engineer in the, in the Army and then in the Oklahoma Army National Guard after that. Um, I ended up getting my undergraduate degree from Hawaii Pacific University while we were stationed in Hawaii. Um, uh -huh. Love, that's a nice place. <laughs> that is a nice place to go to school. <laughs> when we came back to Oklahoma, I got my dream job to work at the Federal Reserve Bank. My undergraduate degree was in finance. And um, so I got to work at the Fed for 10 years in their management development program and managed everything from cash to um, HR, public affairs, financial management, and ultimately ended up um, managing um, the Check 21 infrastructure for the Federal Reserve System and all mm. the um, check processing sites at that time. There were over 20. Um, it's much more consolidated now. I think there's just one. Um, but managed those consolidations and was second level to, um, support from an IT standpoint. Um, so I kind of cut my teeth from a FinTech kind of payment standpoint. Um, at the Federal Reserve. And then the Fed paid for me to get my master's in economics. They also sent me to a graduate school of banking at the University of Wisconsin. And there, I am. Um, the reason I went to college in the first place was that the local community banker in town, I would carry groceries for her in high school. <laughs> and that really encouraged me to go to college. She would um, give me money to take the ACT. So I really revered her as not just a leader in our community, but someone who shaped my life and kind of kicked mm -hmm. me to do more and when I was in banking school I just fell in love with not only the concept of banking but this um, the responsibility of a community banker and what they mean um, to the citizens in their community so when my classmates recruited me up to his bank in northern Minnesota to be uh, in the CFO type of role um, so I was there for two years and during this time my mother married into the family that owns Citizens Bank of Edmond or part of Citizens and the bank got into trouble and my stepfather called and asked if I would be willing to come down and help turn around the bank. So um, in the meantime, I got married, had three children. Okay. And that's, that's kind of the story of Jill. Okay. So then you, you, you come to, uh, back to Edmund and um, what, what was the state of play? Because that was, was this during the financial crisis that uh, this all happened? Yes, it was 2009, July 1st, 2009 is when I came back. I thought they had just had a Federal Reserve examination and the financial crisis really didn't hit Oklahoma like it did the rest of the nation. And we were ended up being the only troubled bank in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area. So um, we, um, I can't, walked in, I thought I was coming into a bit of a turnaround. <laughs> what I found was uh, rampant fraud. Um, we were- Wow. Uh, we really had done everything to ourselves. It wasn't an economic condition that, that caused the bank to be troubled. We were um, not conducting inspections to, uh, for draws. So we would have a million dollars um, fully um, drawn out on a, on a construction loan for a house. And then you drive by where the house is supposed to be. And it's just a, a lot, um, like an empty piece of dirt. And um, we ended up having $12 million in loan losses that first year. Um, and for a bank that's th at that time was 350 million, which is 30 million in capital, losing over a third of your capital in a 12 month period. And really our, our bank, our largest shareholders are employee stock ownership program. So there wasn't capital accessibility. We're also a sub S bank. So our stockholders play, pay our taxes. So we couldn't distribute out to cover that. Um, you know, it was a really a time where the bank was searching for its identity and was trying to fight to recover. I had come back to the bank. I had taken a 50% cut in pay from where I was, and the management didn't want me here. I didn't really realize that until I came. And, oh, jeez. And uh, so I didn't have responsiveness. No one would give me correct information. Um, the fraud resulted, uh, we had um, over $2 million of expense abuse within the first six months of that 2009. Uh, we were paying for weddings and uh, medical <laughs> for kids and you know all kinds of crazy things and you know I just uncovered that it resulted in the turnover of our whole senior management team 
And so I really kind of took the helm of the bank without having the positional authority to be in that role. And, um, and we ended up orchestrating the, the fastest turnaround in the nation without adding capital. So it took about 18 months for us to get things kind of the ship righted. And we did that by shrinking and we couldn't add capital. So we focused on the asset size of the bank, went from 350 million to 250 million and um, got maintained our capital ratios the whole time. So we were never not well capitalized. And then, um, you know, ran off high interest rate depositors and, and started really um, seeing what the, what sustained this bank for this, the hundred year period up to that point that the bank had been in existence. Um, what had sustained it was the social capital that they, the bank had built, right. you know, for a century. And so the depositors would come to us and they weren't demanding their money back. They were demanding to know whether the bank was going to survive because of how important Citizens Bank was to Edmond. And the bank started in 1901 before statehood. The next oldest bank came in 1976. So for three quarters of a century, we were the, the community bank of our town of 100,000. Wow. Uh, wow. So, yeah. so you were a real, yeah, real important part of, of that community then. Um, so maybe you could just, I, I'd be curious about how, how you got through that difficult period. Because obviously I imagine it wasn't always uh, an, a done deal. It wasn't always, it wasn't obvious that you were going to succeed, I imagine. So how, how did you take the bank through such a difficult period as a newcomer, really? Yeah, I um, I knew since, so the Employee Stock Ownership at Program, our bank, owns more than a third of our bank. And so if this bank fell, it was going to be um, detrimental to the people that were working here. And also I knew what a gap it would be to um, our community. So and my motto during that time was that failure was not an option. Um, I would not allow it to be discussed and I mm -hmm. would fight until the end to manage every single ratio I possibly could um, and just being obsessive with doing only the right thing, being above reproach in everything that we did and not tolerating anything beyond that. And it was a time where I was a very uh, authoritative leader. Um, I am not my, it's not my natural state, but you know, I had a situation where I didn't really trust the people I worked with um, to make good decisions because they were consistently either providing me false information or mm -hmm. And I didn't have the authority to be able to remove them. And so as a result, it had to be this super controlled, um, really all the decisions going through one individual time period, which is, again, it's not sustainable. It's terrible for our culture. Um, but at that time was really the necessary thing that had to happen. And so we went from being where failure is not an option, you know, not an innovative way of managing a company at all, to now trying to facilitate that failure is an option, that we want to be able to fail small and where it doesn't right. impact the customer. But in that period of time, it was demanding perfection. So again, not a sustainable model and not the type of leader that I want to be known to be, um, but it was a necessary thing to get done in order to, to save this bank. Right. So then, okay, so you've fast forward, you know, uh, 11 years or thereabouts. Um, how do you, how do you describe your bank today? Maybe give us a sense of the size and what the different, uh, what your customer base is like and what type, what type of loans you hold in your books, that sort of thing. Yeah. So back then we had 125 employees, six locations and we're 350 million in asset size. And like I mentioned, we shrank. We ended up selling all our branch locations in 2013, consolidating to one location in downtown Edmond, which was um, is a low moderate income track in the middle of an affluent city um, with a lot of empty storefronts whenever we made that decision. And um, so now we're down to one and we've gone from 125 employees to 55, um, all through attrition. We didn't do any layoffs during that period of time. We just tried to um, move uh, as we had turnover, move people to different roles and, and develop a team that was really strong. And uh, right now our asset size is 320 million. Um, that's what it was this morning. Um, but we are that we also have about 25 million of paycheck protection loans that are part of that asset size that we have been using the PVP lending facility. So our real asset size from a capital ratio standpoint is around 295 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at being saying pretty small. So the way that the bank, um, really the competitive advantage for this bank is that our funding source are, are just thousands, tens of thousands 
of non-interest bearing deposits, um, checking accounts for small businesses and um, individuals who basically have pulled their money together um, like they did 119 years ago and they're still doing it today and that, that, that's what grow, our deposit base continues to grow in that non-interest bearing category. So on the deposit side, we look very similar to me what a credit union would look like. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of small accounts. On the um, lending side, we're more of a traditional community bank where it's a mixture of just about every type of loan uh, that you can imagine from small business loans, SBA loans, consumer loans, mortgages, uh, larger size commercial real estate loans. But we have a really um, a staff that's um, well-rounded and that really can handle any kind of requests from a borrower in our community. And we also have secondary market loans. So. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, kind of a, a real traditional community bank. We don't knit, we don't have any kind of niche. Um, it's actually quite the opposite. We just try to be uh, a good community partner for everyone. We want to be, we're Citizens Bank of Edmond. We want to reflect the citizens of our community. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk a bit about the PPP. Um, and I, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot and I noticed uh, you were very active on Twitter around the PPP. And you're giving, I saw you give out your cell phone number uh, several times, I think, uh, on Twitter to, uh, for, um, you know, to try and obviously help, help your small business customers. So maybe just talk a little bit about um, what the, what, what your, the, the people of or your, your customers maybe were asking you and how you reacted to the PPP because obviously this was put together we all know very very quickly and it wasn't easy I mean the many big banks struggled uh, mightily to to get their act together so how were you able to respond uh, so quickly to it well so from a communication standpoint we're committed to being transparent and accessible um, you know, and that's been, especially in times of crisis, you have to do that on steroids. So um, I provide my, always provide my cell phone number out to the public so that they can text me anytime. Um, but we knew that we were feeling the anxiety, just the heaviness of the anxiety and fear that was occurring um, at the time that the PPP was being developed, even that we were really engaged um, in the development of the CARES Act. Um, and that communication had nothing to do with marketing or PR. It was only to try to get some, be some conduit of information, two-way communication with our community and what ended up being more of the smallest business community around the nation to, um, to just provide information, to know that someone, that they know that someone's listening and that will relay their concerns um, as we have a voice with those that are impacting the development or the execution of these programs. Um, so that was part of it. And then, then it turned into, once we were able to get the, the program was being more defined, we became very aware early on before PVP launched that we were gonna have access issues and then we thought other banks would have the same access issue. We are an SBA lender, but if you don't enter anything into ETRAN for 30 days, your authorization is turned off. And so we, we tested a week before PVP deployed, we ran into that issue. So we started sounding the alarm bells and you can do that through formal means, but in a time of crisis, there's not been a better source of getting the right people to hear your message than social media. There just absolutely is not. It gives you mm -hmm. the ability to the highest levels of agencies, um, delegations, um, a, um, associations, associations that maybe not that you're a member of, but they're aligned from a value standpoint. And so we started using our voice for that um, as well. We were committed just as much internally that if, when we launched the PPP program, that we were going to provide status updates to our customers, on those applicants, um, on a regular basis so that they knew where they were in the queue. There was so much anxiety. It's hard to put yourself even in that place of the need of these small business customers to get some type of funding or assurance of funding and knowing that there was this um, basically this pot of gold or I, was, I, I thought it was more similar to like the Hunger Games when they come out of the ground right. <laughs> the there and you knew that there were some people that were already equipped with their applications were ready to go because they had great relationships with the SBA or someone else that was assisting them that could get you know, an advantage of getting to that pot of gold. And so we knew how important it was to be able to communicate, to um, alleviate fears, and then to also talk directly as we could to the SBA and to the Treasury to let them know that this need is there and that we need to make sure that the accessibility is there for our small businesses too. We didn't, the PPP went live on Friday morning. 
and we didn't get guidelines until the night before. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, we didn't get access until late Saturday night. And our first file that I saw saved was at three o'clock in the morning that Sunday morning. And like I said, we only have 55 team members, which um, some of the FinTechs have said, well, that's a lot of people. I only have 11. Well, these 55 team members are also the teller staff, the you know, right. new staff. This is not you know, like a team that is focused exclusively on um, this particular situation. And so we were really trying to mobilize. We only had one um, access point that was working. And so we were just trying to drive, you know, all the applications through that point. It was excruciating, it took forever. Um, in that first phase, we were able to get through quite a few applications, but knew that there was such a gap, and especially in those gig gig workers, contract uh, independent contractors, and um, that couldn't apply until that following Friday after phase when phase one started, and so we knew that there was even more work to do. We we're really fortunate at the very beginning. Tesla software. I had put out a call knowing that we want to stay engaged with customers, so I did a call on social media just asking for fintech partnership opportunities for PPP. Mm -hmm. Tesla came back and offered a free tool for community banks to be able to manage applications through the process and also communication with customers. It was perfect for us. And um, they provide to other um, community banks free as well. Um, that was great. And then from that point, it really able to, we were able to get a partnership with MX who then helped us get where if we only had one access point, we could drive all of our applications through that access point through the right. Those, those applications going. But again, again, using social media to communicate the status of where we were with customers. And we saw a lot of anxiety from small business customers not thinking that they were qualified or that they um, were sophisticated enough to be able to apply. So our team spent hours and even days with some business owners trying to make sure that their applications were complete so that they could get this much needed funding. So the communication is, was mainly for those that had the least amount of resources available to them to know that the program was accessible to them. Right. And then at the same time, I was working to try to match make um, uh, small businesses that maybe be in New York or Florida or California, with Texas, with the community banks in those areas that could serve them well, because we were having to base our limited resources limited to just Oklahoma um, applicants. Right, right. And so did you, did you focus, obviously, um, your existing small business customers, I imagine would have been your primary focus, but did you, did you help many customers, many small businesses that were not Citizens Bank customers? Yeah, so the first round, um, we did prioritize our customers and we actually triage. We were trying to um, to help those that were in the most critical need first. Um, and sometimes those were borrowers and sometimes they were not. Um, and then we really focused more on our customer base only because that's only what we could handle from a volume standpoint. Uh, phase two, we opened that up to all of Oklahoma. And um, I'm not sure what the, I don't, I don't think I have percentages, but I would, I would, it would be a good wager to say that at least 50% of those that we served were not already, they weren't legacy customers of Citizens Bank of Edmond. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Cause I'm curious cause you have with our story, which I've shared is that, you know, we, we bank, we have banked with a top, a top four bank for, you know, for you know, since the founding of Lend It and we weren't getting anywhere. And obviously I know a lot of people in the FinTech space and the small business space, but we ended up going with a small community bank here in Denver which we're now moving to at the VR primary bank. And I'm just wondering, like, it seems like there's many community banks that have come out of this really in a positive light. And it sounds like, you know, obviously your bank is one of them. Um, so do you, I mean, do you think that this has been uh, like a real net positive for your bank and for community banks in general? I think it shows that you want to have some type of local accountability and I encourage anyone to bank somewhere where you know that you can go meet with a CEO or get them on the phone. And so if you're, if you bet that's a big bank that their CEO is accessible to you, then that's great. But you want to be sure that you can talk to the person that's ultimately making decision and is accountable for how, whether it's your direction in which their bank is going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. You certainly can't get that with a, with a large bank. Um, I want to move. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, uh, Mark Cuban, who uh, 
I was on Twitter when uh, he put out a call um, for saying, hey, let, I want an innovative banker to come work with me to create a program for consumers. And, uh, and I saw you actually responded really quickly. And then next thing I know, I'm reading about it in American Banker that you've, uh, you've got this, uh, this program in place. So tell us a little bit about that process and what, what actually you, what you created with Mark Cuban. Yeah, so my phone started blowing up from friends that were following Mark Cuban and saw the post. And um, I had many of them that responded and tagged me on it. And then I had a lot of text messages from them as well, primarily from the FinTech community. And then they started mobilizing other people in the FinTech community. I responded, gave him my cell phone number, responded a couple of times, um, I, but I didn't hear anything. But another um, FinTech a friend um, sent me an email and said, hey, I have Mark's um, email address. Um, he does publicize it, so you might try this because he said he does monitor that account. So I emailed him and um, he um, said that he would call me back. Um, he wanted to call and talk about it. Um, so then he did call me. It was in the middle of my board meeting, actually. And, um, and so we had about a seven minute conversation and it was really just like it was a shark tank pitch almost. <laughs> I had my pitch and then he destroyed that pitch and then had his kind of what I really want to see happen um, response. And so, and then I gave him some feedback about some concerns I had about it, but then some things I saw that were really good about his perspective on it. And it was mainly um, talking then about a line of credit. He called back and, um, and if, uh, about an hour or two later and just said, hey, I, I think I have another idea. Why don't we don't, let's don't mess with a loan. Let's look at an overdraft program. Um, because then you don't have to do as much, you don't have to do underwriting. Um, I, I was concerned about the bank's exposure to an unsecured loan program mm -hmm. and basically float um, the, the funds until someone gets a stimulus check. I mean, it, it was an exposure of multi-million dollars in a bank that has $30 million of capital. So, um, yeah, I was really concerned about the, our exposure, but wanted to provide, both of us had this uh, focus on helping. And so... Um, the overdraft, I thought, I, it's talking to him, I could outline pretty quickly how I thought that we could accomplish something, and he agreed with some of the, the um, criteria, and then asked me to come up with a plan, and then um, I, so I came up with a plan, and after huddling our staff, I grabbed the team both times and just said, okay, first of all, this is what I've done. Do we want to move forward with having discussions with Mark Cuban about this? And it was a resounding yes. And then when he came back and we kind of formulated a plan and um, brought the team back together and they're like, this sounds great. I'm like, yeah, but this is exposing us to a significant financial risk, significant financial risk. And then we have a significant regulatory risk from a compliance standpoint because overdrafts are such a sensitive area and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And everybody was just a resounding yes. Some, some risks that we identify, we were able to mitigate. So I emailed um, Mark Cuban back and said, okay, we're he wanted me to send him what I was going to tweet out. And I said something like, we'll be posting soon our new program on this. And he basically just gave me the cut <laughs> And I was like, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty basic. And I can get that any bank to say something is coming soon. We need something now. And so I said, okay, well, how about if I can do it done by Tuesday? And this was this email I think was on Saturday. And he's like, okay, that'll work. Um, tell me when you're going to send it out on Monday. And so um, we were able to hustle and get it done uh, by Monday rather than by Tuesday. And, and he continues to be a leader and at least getting us to think differently about this crisis. And um, there is a, a um, you know, we think we have this, we have this toolkit because we have the financial crisis and the, you know, we took so much effort to make sure the financial crisis wouldn't happen again and that the Fed had all the tools and the Treasury had all the tools that they needed to address the financial crisis. And that crisis last time, you know, was in that mid-market and, you know, it was at, at the much larger banks, much larger um, companies that were affected by it. Um, we still have this toolkit and we're deploying it now because we have now have endured another crisis. But this crisis is so at the small business level, it is at Main Street that this is happening. It's store by store by store by store. And this, the, the systemic spread of the, the economic impact. Um, and it's not this massive attack at the top. And so he's done a great job of really trying to break away from convention and, and to identify that these, this toolbox isn't adequate. And 
Um, and he's got the ability to get to the highest level of government. And, and, and also uh, the, the whole thing with this partnership with us wasn't about Citizens Bank of Edmond. Um, Mark was wanting to use a bank that could plant a seed and then it spread. And, um, and that's exactly what happened. We ended up having over 400 interactions with different banks around the United States and ended up in national publications on all kinds of um, chats on social media and with large groups um, that, that we were able to then really get everyone to start thinking about could we help uh, from an overdraft standpoint and that's where you saw lots of banks shift to not charging overdraft fees um, applying more liberal overdraft um, management and so that's that was really what his his focus was was kind of the same way that this crisis was occurring where it was like one storefront at a time having a challenge was making the change from kind of one bank at a time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so then what was the specific product you said it was an overdraft product was it tied to the stimulus checks so have you and you put it in place and obviously stimulus checks have been arriving are, are, are people you know paying you back like you expected yeah, so it was a little bit different. We um, so the criteria included that you had that your stimulus money had your 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 previous um, um, tax payment or tax refund had to come out of your citizen's account, and then so we knew then the tax um, the stimulus check was right. one of the citizens account, and so that was one of the criteria, and so all those funds have come in. We have seen our overdraft be triple what they're norm what they normally are and um, we've been exceptionally liberal with how we've been processing overdraft payments making sure that we're not keeping food off someone's table because we won't process a check so um, we are maintaining higher overdraft balances and again trying to really help our community weather the storm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay okay we're almost out of time but a couple of things I want to get to um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of talk about uh, digital banks and in fact many of the digital banks have been adding customers by the thousands every day um, in this crisis so I'd be curious to get your take um, how do you see do you see digital banks as really a competitor to you as a complement I mean how do you how do you view this kind of you know digital banking movement yeah, I think digital banking is, I mean, in some ways a compliment, in some ways it's competitive. Um, you know, I think that there's a rapid evolution of the community bank to where it can be both a digital bank as well as your traditional community bank on the corner. I mean, for us, you can open all your accounts online and you can manage it through our mobile um, system or we're about to upgrade our mobile banking so then we can it has an open API, so we can plug in lots of things to make it sexier. So, um, you know, I think what's happened with digital banking is it's really pushed conventional, conventional banking to be more and to be relevant. And so, um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time um, concerned about other digital banks, but I do spend time being inspired by them. And so I do think they're elevating the game of all of banking. And, um, you know, it's great to see um, the way that they've built some of their business models that allow you to be um, very um, thoughtful about the income regarding your customers to not be as dependent upon that but to be able to have a sustainable uh, revenue source or business plan so that you can stay around for another hundred years which is our our goal right right okay well let um the last question then what uh you know, we're in this, we're in the middle of this, uh, you know, real, what's going to be a financial crisis. Um, I'm curious about what do you see the next, you know, six, six to 12 months holding for Citizens Bank? Well, for us, we're, you know, we're, we're planning for the worst, but we're hoping for the best. So we know that um, there's going to be some small businesses, especially, and, and some consumers in our community that um, this temporary crisis is going to have a longer term impact on them. So we're focusing a lot more on portfolio management. But then we're also looking at this crisis as ways, to, how do we look at things we implemented in the short term as convenience offerings to our customer and be able to develop them into longer term solutions to increase the accessibility our customers have to their finances. And so for something like um, curbside banking, we were running things out to customers outside, trying to keep safe distances. Well, now we formalize that so that we have um, curbside banking that Customers can now go online or use their mobile to schedule a time and to do non-cash related transactions at the curbside um, and then be able to um, 
to use restaurant style buzzers if there's a wait inside the bank to be able to go and and take advantage of all the great fun in downtown Edmond and then come back to the bank whenever their their point in time comes back so it's really about how do you take these things that we kind of MacGyvered up during the crisis and and make perfect them and make them something that makes banking even better post-crisis than it was before Right. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there. It's fascinating. You've, you've, it's really been fascinating to watch you uh, and your and your company sort of operate through uh, what's you know what is a very challenging time for everybody. So, thank you for coming on the show today, Jill. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. See ya.